Christine, welcome to Real Vision. Hi, Ash. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you here. It's your first time on the platform. We've wanted to have you on for some time now and very excited to have you here to talk about Ethereum EIP-1559. If you don't know what that is yet, don't worry about it. We'll tell the whole story uh, here today. But give us a little bit of the big picture, Christine. Uh, For people who are not familiar with the mechanics of how Ethereum works, talk a little bit about what the basic use case for Ethereum is. Yeah, well, I mean, I hope for listeners and for viewers who don't really know much about Ethereum, they'll know or hopefully know a little bit about Bitcoin. So let me start there. Let me first explain a little bit about what Bitcoin is, because Bitcoin is what inspired the creation of Ethereum in 2015. So Bitcoin, the world's first and largest cryptocurrency, is this decentralized network on which anyone from anywhere can send and receive Bitcoins without the need for a bank or any intermediate intermediary, really, you can directly transfer value from one person to another. But what if that same technology that Bitcoin uses could transfer the value of not just Bitcoins, but any digital currency that you want. So value in the form of, say, real estate tokens that represent a share in real life property or the value in the form of a U.S. dollar peg stable coin where the coins and the tokens that you create represent basically a dollar. So that's what Ethereum does. On a very high level, Ethereum lets users easily create their own digital assets, assets that have their own set of predefined rules like Bitcoin does when it comes to supply, monetary policy. And like Bitcoin, it also transfers all these coins over this immutable, decentralized and permissionless blockchain. So that's like the very high level functionality of Ethereum and what it was created for. Um, But there are very good illustrations of what Practically speaking, ever since Ethereum launched in 2015, what it, what people have actually been building on the project. So I can definitely go into things like ICOs, NFTs, DeFi. Christine, let's talk about some of those use cases. NFTs, DeFi, smart contracts. Give us a thumbnail sketch of what the significance of those technologies are. Yeah, well, let me start first by talking a little bit about what came before the DeFi and NFT craze that we're seeing lately on the on the Ethereum platform. Between 2017 and 2018, we saw Ethereum primarily being used to actually fundraise for cryptocurrency projects and startups. And like I explained with, with the high-level overview on Ethereum, you can very easily launch your own cryptocurrencies. And when Ethereum first launched, its founders figured out this kind of legal loophole for arguing in front of U.S. regulators that its native cryptocurrency, Ether, was not a security, but a utility and therefore not subject to securities law. This is a very different topic, but it's important because a lot of crypto projects after that point ran with this and started to mimic basically that same argument, launch their own coins, their own utility tokens, um, basically through what's called an initial coin offering and ICO. Um, So... There was a lot of money raised on the platform. And in all honesty, the founder of Ethereum, Vitalik uh, Buterin, he wasn't all that ecstatic about this use case. Um, There are quite a lot of scammy ICO projects out there um, and tokens that were being released that gained a lot of investor um, funds, a lot of investor money, but didn't ever really go anywhere. So I'm pleased to say that Moving, evolving out of that point, developers on Ethereum have continued to build different kinds of applications, different kinds of tokens. And since 2020, decentralized finance has just kind of taken off. So I've got this chart here. It shows that total value locked in DeFi. Perfectly explained and also perfectly summarized in terms of the history for how we got to where we are right now, which is your report released uh, very recently called the investment implications of Ethereum improvement proposal 1559. That's a bit of a mouthful, but let's break it down here a little bit and try to understand what some of the challenges are right now in the Ethereum ecosystem and what those solutions that are proposed by this is. I should say, I thought very powerfully, the first line of this report right in the executive summary is uh, 
The most expensive blockchain to use in the world is Ethereum. It's generating $5 million in transaction fees. BTC, Bitcoin, charges roughly a quarter of that fee uh, in aggregate, even though it is three times larger by market cap. It's true. Ethereum does have quite a few structural limitations. And like you said, because DeFi and NFTs, these other use cases for Ethereum has really taken off over the past couple of years. Um, Unfortunately, the platform itself hasn't quite grown along with the user activity that's been building on the platform. The network currently can only handle roughly 30 transactions per second, which is definitely better than Bitcoin, but not by a lot and certainly not high enough to compete with that of traditional payments processors like Visa and MasterCard. So the big issue on Ethereum is definitely the issue of scalability. And as more users start interacting with DeFi with NFTs, and as more developers start building these kinds of applications, the network does get clogged and it gets really bogged down and transactions start to take hours, if not days to process. And these fees, yes, like you said, the high fees, um, they start excluding certain users from being able to use the platform. Um, people who don't have, you know, $50 just lying around to spare and, and try trading on a decentralized exchange. It's not um, super accessible in that way. But there are solutions being worked on. Um, unfortunately, the solution of Ethereum Improvement Proposal 1559 is not actually going to help the issue of high fees or scalability. Um, that's one of the biggest misconceptions about EMP1559. EMP1559 is primarily to tackle a different issue, and that's high, that's fee volatility, basically fees right. being unpredictable for users. Um, so developers do kind of need to figure out their priorities, but it seems like the priority right now is to to figure out the volatility issue. Yeah, it seems like the as you describe it in your report, the goal is really to just try and stabilize this. And of course, we have Ethereum 2.0 coming down the pike in the not too distant future. It seems as though uh, it's just moving a bit in that direction. Explain a little bit about what this fee structure looks like. Uh, tell us a little bit for people who don't know uh, about gas gas prices, transaction costs, gas limits, all of these terms of art uh, that seem very obscure and very arcane, but are incredibly important if you're transacting on the Ethereum network. Definitely. It can be very confusing, especially because gas on Ethereum has multiple meanings. Gas can refer to the fee, the transaction fee of, of whatever you're trying to do on Ethereum. But by and large, for the relevance of EIP-1559, gas is a unit of measurement. It's a unit of account, and it measures the computational load that whatever you're trying to do um, takes up on the network. So if I'm trying to send a transaction to another person on the network, it'll cost a certain amount of gas. And that is directly proportional to the computational energy it requires to execute. So if you're executing like an entire application, an entire DeFi exchange, your gas cost is going to be a lot higher. And normally on Ethereum, while the gas cost is set in stone, you can't change that. You can't say that, oh, you know, my decentralized exchange is not going to take up that much energy to, to execute. Um, that's already said. What you can say is I'm only going to set um, a very low rate of exchange between the unit of gas and ETH. Usually we, we talk about uh, this conversion as the gas rate and the gas rate is completely up for, for people to, to decide themselves. And the higher that you can, you can make that gas rate, the more likely it is that your transaction, your smart contract, whatever it is that you want to do on the Ethereum will get executed faster because you've set a higher price for it. And the miners in the network who are more incentivized, they're more financially incentivized to take your transaction and, and include it in the next block. So what EIP-1559 does is it actually takes that kind of a dynamic out of the hands of the user and it allows the network to automatically set an optimized gas rate for everybody called the base fee. And the reason why this removes the volatility of fees is because no longer is this a blind auction style fee market. It's a fee market that you can know and you can predict where the, the gas rate is going to go. In 
in every single block, there's limited capacity, but every time the capacity of each block is, is above a certain limit, the next block is going to have a gas rate that's 12.5% higher than the previous block. So the, the gas rate increases in a kind of like step-by-step function, and it's not it's not going to rapidly increase up and down according to the markets. It's going to be dictated by this algorithmic protocol that is intended by developers to make the Ethereum fee market just that much more easy for users to understand and hopefully for decentralized applications to start really building bigger businesses also so they're not um, bogged down by this guessing game of what's a good gas rate for this for this moment in time. Um, There are other side consequences of EIP-1559, such as the burn mechanism that may or may not impact Ethereum's inflationary, deflationary monetary policy, but that's not the main point of EIP-1559. Those are some external circumstances, consequences. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.